Okay, today we're going to start looking at a market structure known as perfect competition. In fact, we'll start looking at what the different market structures are um, in general, and then we'll get specific with perfect competition. This information is going to be in your book. It's pages 330 to 334 and 336 to 340. First off, let's start and talk about market structures for a minute. There's several different types of markets that we'll talk about over the next several weeks. Um, and they depend on two major factors. First is how many firms are there? Is there just one firm? Are there many firms? Or are there just a few? And we'll also look at the type of product. Is it identical or is it differentiated in some way? And the answer to those two questions will dictate what type of market structure we're talking about. So when it comes to identical versus differentiated, again, it's does the producer create something that is substantially different than some other producer? So in the case of corn, one farmer's corn is another farmer's corn. So we would say that that's an identical product. Whereas cars, on the other hand, are different. Uh, some are trucks, some are sedans, some are electric, some are hybrid, some are red, some are blue, some have leather seats, some do not. And so all of these cars are strongly differentiated um, and different from each other. Gasoline is, generally speaking, is an identical product. It doesn't matter where you get your gas from. It's all the same. Um, number two pencils are identical. It doesn't matter what your number two pencil is, uh, who manufactured it. It's still got an eraser. It's still got graphite lead. It's still got a wood base. It's the same thing. So we would say that those are identical. Um, whereas breakfast cereal would be differentiated because you have lots of different types. You've got corn versus wheat versus sugary versus ones with fruit, etc. So those would all be differentiated. And if we put them all in a matrix, what we find is that when there is only one producer, then by definition the products are not differentiated. They're, they are um, the same. Uh, we have what's called a monopoly. If you have a few firms, not many, but more than one, then we have what's called an oligopoly, and it doesn't matter whether your products are the same or differentiated, it's still what we call an oligopoly. If you have many, many firms, uh, more than can control the price uh, of a good, and the products are exactly the same, we have what's called perfect competition, and if you have many, many firms, but they have differentiated products, we'll talk about monopolistic competition. And we'll talk about all of those in more detail in the future. But for right now, let's focus on perfect competition. With perfect competition, there are a couple of general characteristics that we would expect. One is that there will be many firms in the market. But by that, I mean there are so many firms in the market that no one producer can dictate uh, the equilibrium price and quantity of the good. So essentially, all of the producers in a perfectly competitive market are what we call price takers. The market sets the price and then that's the price that you have to deal with as a producer. It is whatever the market decides to set. We also assume that the firms are selling identical products. So my goods are the same as yours, it's the same as anybody else's. It doesn't matter where you go to get the good, it will be the same. And we assume no barriers to entry or exit, meaning that um, that in the long run, firms can enter or exit the market at no cost. It doesn't incur any sort of penalty or cost for them to be able to enter into or exit the market. So there's going to be no government regulation. There's going to be no patents or something like that. Um, nothing that would prevent you as a firm from either entering if there's a profit or exiting if there's loss. We can look at an example um, of a perfectly competitive situation. We could say, um, in this case, that uh, because the firm is a price taker, that the price for the goods firm or for the firm's goods are going to be eight dollars, and it doesn't matter how many they sell, the market will have selected that price as a result of supply and demand. And so we can see um, that the marginal revenue, the increase in revenue that comes with an additional sale of a good, is going to be eight dollars all the way through because the price is going to remain the same. So then, based on our experience so far, we can kind of safely say then that the, the profit maximizing level of output would be five units. Why? Because the marginal revenue of eight dollars is equal to the marginal cost of production at five units. And so when they are equal, when the increase in revenue is equal to the increase in costs, that's our profit maximizing point. At four, 
we see that we're bringing in eight dollars for the sale of the good it only costs us six that's profitable that would make sense to make the fourth but at the sixth unit I'm making eight dollars for that unit but it cost me ten to make so I'm losing two so my profit is going to be maximized there at the quantity of five so if we know that marginal revenue equals marginal cost and price is equal to marginal revenue then there's a couple of other things um, that we can say in a perfectly competitive market so if the output rule is marginal revenue must equal marginal cost and we know that the price of the good is equal to its marginal revenue then essentially what we can say then is that the marginal revenue curve is equal to the demand curve that it is perfectly elastic um, for this good for this producer and we could say that in part because if there's lots of different firms producing the exact same good then if our price were to rise above the uh, market equilibrium price then um, the quantity demanded would would go to zero no one would want our good because why would they pay more for it's the exact same thing as they could get somewhere else for cheaper and if the price was less than the market price then there'd be an infinite demand for our goods because if you could get the same good for cheaper why wouldn't you so essentially the demand curve in a perfectly competitive market for the individual firm is its marginal revenue or the market price that's set of course, knowing the profit maximizing quantity doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to produce that amount because profit maximizing could be minimizing my loss. It's not necessarily the case that the profit maximizing point is actually one in which there is positive economic profit. It is possible that it would be a negative economic profit. So we need to know more than just what the, the profit maximizing quantity is. We need to know whether it's actually truly profitable or not. So we would look at an equation like this where we'd say profit, which is designated by the Greek letter pi, profit is equal to my total revenue, how much money is coming in, so the quantity I sold times the price, minus my total cost of production. And if I find that um, my total revenue is greater than total cost, then I would say the firm is profitable. If total revenue is less than total cost, then I would say there is a loss. And if they are the same, then it's saying that the firm is, quote, breaking even. Now, of course, all of these cost numbers, we're assuming, incorporate economic profit. So we've gone beyond the accounting costs and looking now at economic profit. So we will assume from here on out that when we say total cost, that it includes the implicit cost of capital um, and time, et cetera. And so uh, anytime we see a profit from here on out, we're talking about economic profit. But there's more to it than just saying that total revenue equals total cost is breaking even or that if it's greater or less than total cost, we have profit or loss. We could go further. We could say that the profit per unit is equal to our total revenue divided by quantity minus total cost divided by quantity. And we know that total revenue divided by quantity is average revenue. It's the revenue per unit. And we know that the revenue per unit is our marginal revenue. And we know that's equal to price. And we know that total cost divided by output is our average total cost. So we could actually rewrite the profit um, equation and say that profit per unit is equal to price minus average total cost. Why does that matter? Well, because when we put the average total cost curve onto the graph along with our marginal revenue and marginal cost curves, we can then see whether or not we have a profit. So if price is greater than average total cost, then our firm is considered profitable. If price is less than average total cost, we have a loss. And if they're equal, then we have what's known as normal profit, or we are breaking even. And we look at that on a graph and look at it like this. At this point, where average total cost intersects the marginal revenue curve at marginal cost, where they all intersect, this would be normal profit. Our revenue, which is price times quantity, is equal to our average total cost. And so our total costs are the same as our total revenue, and therefore we have zero profit. If the average total cost curve were below the price, then we would have a profit. And if the uh, average total cost curve was above the price that we bring in, we would have a loss. And we're going to look at that in some more detail in the next class and begin to be able to actually graph profit and loss as we look at, at perfect competition in more detail. And I will see you then.